Good morning. I thought the bells were done. Good morning. I think we'll get started even though the bells are still going. Um, let's say good morning. We've got a lot of guests and visitors here with us this morning. Uh, just FYI and you guys that uh, we have a lot of people listening on the radio. We go live on the radio and then also uh, over the internet. So not only my opinion, isn't it nice to say good morning to one another here? Yeah, it sure is. It's also nice to say good morning to those folks joining us via the media, whatever. So we just join together and say good morning, media friends. Okay, here we go. Good morning, media friends. Good to have everybody as we gather around the gospel uh, this morning. Today, Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. Uh, you think of what's going on. Uh, Holy Week, you know, just a month and a half ago or so. And then last week we're looking at Jesus' ascension. And so uh, 10 days after Jesus' ascension is what we call Pentecost. Um, sometimes people would refer to it as the birthday of the New Testament church. Um, okay, yeah, the, when we think of Acts chapter 2, what we'll be reading through in a minute. Um, but we think of and, and especially focus on the, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the work that God the Holy Spirit does uh, for us, how he creates and strengthens our faith in this whole process of salvation. So uh, an awful lot of what we're doing this morning is based on reminding us of that work of God the Holy Spirit. So let's get started with our worship here this morning. Let's do that by singing our first hymn. Would you grab a hymnal and let's sing hymn 183. Would you please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Thank you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We trust and take comfort in the peace of this forgiveness. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of our praise. Join with me and let's pray together our prayer of the day there. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us and bless us this joyful day with your gift of grace. Rekindle the fire of faith in our hearts so that we share your love with those around us in a true and living faith of our Savior, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Wouldn't it be a whole lot easier carrying out Jesus' great commission, right? Before he ascended into heaven, he told us, he told his church, Christian church to go and teach all nations. Wouldn't it be easier to do that if everybody had the same language? We wouldn't have to send one person to speak Japanese or Russian or Spanish, what have you, but you look at how it is that we got where we are, the, the Tower of Babel, that mankind, when we go through here, this Tower of Babel, we'll see that Mankind was not following through with God's command to Adam and Eve after the fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. He said, go and spread out, uh, fill the earth. And we see here the mankind saying, nah, we're going to stick together. Let's find a good place, the plain of Shinar. And then, once we get there, let's build a monument to ourselves. And, and so in response to this arrogance and this disobedience, God has a very effective way of carrying out his command. Instead of fire and thunder and lightning and spread out or else, he just simply confuses their language, right? It's a challenge to exist with somebody whom you can't communicate with. And so here we have this 
setting for us and how it is that we do our mission work, how we share our faith uh, with the world around us, Tower of Babel, the, the creation of different languages that we have here in Genesis, uh, Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build us ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. That's the end of our first scripture lesson. Alleluia! You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Alleluia! Pentecost, I mentioned before, the birthday of the New Testament church, Acts chapter 2 here. We see uh, the, the follow-up, right, to the Tower of Babel. The, one of the miracles that happened here was those disciples miraculously speaking, teaching in all kinds of different languages. And, and I think it's important for us to, to understand the context. It's kind of like 50 days prior to this. Remember on the Passover when Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room, all kinds of Jews from all over the world were there in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And it's very similar. Pentecost is not just a New Testament thing. Uh, the festival of Pentecost was an Old Testament festival that what God had prescribed. And so it's just like the Passover. Jews from all over the world were there for the Passover. And now, 50 days after that, it's the same thing. Jews from all over the world were here in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And now that's carried over into what we call and refer to as Pentecost in the New Testament. But, therefore, all the different people from all over the world with different languages being preached to, being taught by Peter and the disciples. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, they being Christians. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. 
these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's our second scripture lesson. Would you grab that hymnal again? Let's join in our second hymn this morning, hymn number 461.
Grace, peace, and mercy are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Your friends, even though gas right now, at least I didn't go by a gas station this morning, at least as of yesterday, gas was four fifty-four a gallon, probably making it a little more impractical to what I, a lot of us, we like to do during the summertime, is to do a little driving, to do some gallivanting, some exploring. That whether you're exploring around northeast Nebraska here in our own state, or if you're taking a longer trip, personally, when I do that, I'm old-fashioned, and I like to get out the good old paper map. And I like to look at the possibilities around, and where can I go exploring, looking at this map. And I especially, in the state of Nebraska, around here, I like pulling out what's called a gazetteer, that it's even got the minimum maintenance roads on there, and I take a look at there and I say, where are those little blue splotches on the map that say there's water? Maybe there's a lake there. I wonder, maybe there's some good fishing over there. Let's go do some exploring, get out the map. Or even if we're going somewhere longer, Arizona, wherever. I like to get out that map and say, ah, let's get off the beaten path. Let's do some exploring. Maybe let's see some things that you couldn't see, you won't see if you just stay on the interstate. Look at the map. And when you get out that map, three things are pretty vital for us to understand in order to appreciate what's going on, right? If you don't understand how a map, a good old-fashioned paper map works, it's just a bunch of lines, some different colors, a bunch of words. It really doesn't make sense unless you understand three things, right? You have to know, first of all, where I'm starting from to understand that map. You have to understand where I am currently when you're looking at that map, and then you also have to understand where I am going. What's my goal? What's the end destination? And you think of this whole picture of a good old-fashioned paper map. Isn't really that what God's holy word is all about? Mapping out for us what is the direction to get from A to B, to get from here, ultimately, to eternal life. And as much as on a Pentecost Sunday like today is, as we're focusing on God, the Holy Spirit, his work of sanctification, <clears throat> you read through our text in just a minute here, and we'll see, all three persons of the Trinity are involved here. Of course, Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity is speaking. He's referring to his heavenly Father, God the Father, who created us and gives us that physical ability to live here, gives us a time of grace. And he also refers to God the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean to step on the toes of Pastor Schliwe next weekend. He's got Trinity Sunday talking about this. But this is so vital for us to remember this whole aspect, what it is that happens for our salvation, what has been accomplished by that triune God, God the Holy Spirit, for us to reach heaven. And so we have here in front of us God's roadmap for peace. When we look at this road map, this direction that God gives us for peace, again, we see those same three things. Where did I start from? Where am I right now? And where is it that I'm going, we're going as Christians? God's road map for peace. Would you follow along? Our sermon text this morning comes from the Gospel of St. John, John chapter 14, beginning at verse 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. That's our text. It seems like we've been referring to in different readings and such for the last couple of months, been referring 
to this section of Scripture quite a bit, John chapter 14. The context is Jesus and his disciples are in that upper room on that first Monday, Thursday night. And Jesus did a whole lot more in that upper room other than that incredibly important blessing of instituting the Lord's Supper. Again, you look at John chapters 14 all the way through chapter 17. And Jesus is teaching, using this as a last chance, so to speak, to educate, to teach, to remind his disciples of who he was. In just a few hours, Jesus would be falsely arrested. He would be tortured. In just a few hours after this, Jesus would be hanging on the cross. And here he is, reminding his disciples of that fact. Jesus wasn't here to be a social leader, to be a political leader. He was here to be a spiritual leader, to be the forgiver of sins. And throughout the last three years prior to this of Jesus and his disciples in the upper room, don't we see peaks and valleys of faithfulness displayed by the disciples? I think of, and I don't mean to throw Peter under the bus, but boy, Peter, outspoken Peter, gets an awful lot of attention. And we see those peaks and valleys of faith certainly when we see Peter. I think of back in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus was testing his disciples. And he asked them a, a, a question. Who do you say that I am? And the disciples came up with all kinds of answers. Well, some people around here say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're, you're a prophet. Jesus says, well, who do you, who do you say I am? Isn't this when Peter is at a very high point in his faith and he gives a rock-solid confession of faith when he says, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God? Absolutely right. But how about, in the context, just, I don't know, a few hours after our text here, that same Peter who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember how he caved in to that incredible peer pressure of that servant girl out in the courtyard that he followed Jesus when he, Jesus was going to be on trial, and there's Peter warming himself by the fire. And that servant girl comes up to him and says, oh, didn't I see you with that guy named Jesus? Didn't I see you? Aren't you a Galilean? Aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? Three times. Peter denies that fact. No, no. Got nothing to do with Jesus. Nope, nope. Want nothing to do. Right? Peaks and valleys of the disciples. Peaks and valley, valleys for me, us. Isn't it easy to be Peter and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, when we're together in this this very safe Christian cocoon we call church. When I'm around my Christian friends, isn't it easy to be, Peter, you are the Christ. But when the situation changes and I'm all by myself, do I have that same attitude that is fearless in confessing my faith as a Christian church, or do I cave in? And I follow the ways of the world around me, and I'm embarrassed to call myself a Christian. We talk about this roadmap for peace that God has established for us, and to us, for us, to understand and appreciate this roadmap for peace, we have to understand where we start on this map. And very clearly, when we go back to Adam and Eve and how mankind, Adam and Eve, ruined God's holy Universe by sinning, by, by selfishly deciding, no, oh, what God has given me is not enough. I want more. This is where we have to understand each and every one of us starts. Ever since then, that fall into sin for Adam and Eve, a sinful nature has been handed down to each and every one of us, each and every generation. I think of David's words in Psalm 51. In sin did my mother conceive me. This aspect that says that sinful nature, that starting point for us in our spiritual lives, say we're in need of a Savior right from the get-go, from the moment our earthly existences have been established. And so we look at this whole aspect, this whole aspect of God's roadmap for peace. And I think of Jesus' words when he's 
speaking to a bunch of faithful followers in his Sermon on the Mount, very early in Jesus' ministry, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. He's talking about how is it that we live? How is it that we as Christians react to this grace of God? And way at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the road, the two options of how we travel through this earthly life. Jesus says in the tail end of his Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, he says, Enter heaven through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Gives me a mental picture of this road to destruction of the wide variety of roads that are options for us to travel on, right? I mentioned before those minimum maintenance roads. I love going down those roads to see what's going down there. But then you go, okay, gravel road, okay, the county road, okay, the state highway. Probably the easiest, the fastest way to get from A to B on the interstate, right? Kind of easy traveling on the interstate. You set your, your speed, I'm going to go 75, set the cruise, just kind of relax a little bit, pay, pay attention, right? But driving on the interstate's kind of easy. I think about this when Jesus refers to this wide is the road that leads to destruction. It's easy. Easy to stay on, to be on that road. All I have to do is follow my sinful nature. All I have to do is do what I want to do. I don't need to listen to you. I don't need to listen to God. I'll do what I want. And this is that incredible segue, a very good segue to say, okay, I know where I am. I know very clearly from Scripture, I'm a sinner. I disobey God's holy word. I am in this state of disobedience. I deserve eternal damnation. But thankfully, when we look at Jesus and what the, the context is for our text, again, very shortly, he's going to be hanging on that cross of Calvary, paying for our sins. And as much as it's embarrassing and hurtful, for me to understand my sinful reality to a righteous and holy God, yet that righteous and holy God makes it very clear to me that my sins are forgiven right now through that Savior, Jesus Christ. We read in our text there, verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Peace. Interesting word that is often misunderstood a lot of times by Christians as well. And you think about the reality of the world in which we live right now. How many examples can't we point to and say, boy, well, there's no peace there. There's no peace over here. How sin destroyed peace between two countries, Ukraine and Russia. How sin destroys peace in a school in Texas. How sin destroys peace that would be so nice in families, between friends. How many different ways can't we say, humanly speaking, in an earthly sense, peace is destroyed because of sinfulness, because of my arrogance, because of my selfishness and the selfishness of all the people around me. But thankfully, that's not the peace that Jesus is talking about. He says, I'm giving you peace that the world cannot, does not give you. I think of this contrast, too. Isn't this what the angels were singing about after Jesus was born? And they were singing to the shepherds, right? Peace on earth. It's not the peace that we all hold hands and get along. Sure, nice. Sure is a blessing when that happens, if that happens. But infinitely better infinitely more important is the peace that you and I have right now when we look at that road map of peace where are we right now you and I as Christians can sit here in all peace knowing that our sins are forgiven knowing what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on that cross of Calvary and through that empty tomb and let's not forget that work of the other two persons of the Trinity too right it's God the Father who creates me, gives me this time of grace, the opportunity to learn about that peace. And then it's also that third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, who gives me that faith and creates that, strengthens that faith so I can stay in that peace of God's grace until I reach my ultimate goal. That's 
part three, right? I know where I started, I know where I am, and now through, Christ, through faith and through this roadmap of peace we call God's holy word, let's also look to the future. And I'd say there's two futures for us to remember. A small, small picture future that refers to this earthly life, and ultimately the big picture future that refers to eternal life in heaven. What do we do with this roadmap of peace? Now that we know where we started, what has been accomplished to forgive my sins, now what do I do into the future? The small picture says, boy, I keep growing in that grace, right? I keep taking advantage of that means of grace, the gospel and word and sacrament, to strengthen my faith, not just for myself, so I can better resist Satan's temptations, but so that I can do, basically, what we were referring to in Genesis 11 and Acts chapter 2. To get this mission work done, to get my faith out to people who don't know about this road map of peace, who don't know the huge importance of Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished to forgive the sins of all people. I keep growing. I keep better preparing myself to be a more and more effective minister, missionary, servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then one day, one day, when the good Lord so chooses, then he'll take me home, the ultimate home, right? The ultimate location, the ultimate destination, in true peace, perfect peace, perfect holiness, perfect harmony with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just in a few verses at the beginning of John chapter 4, Jesus is referring to this ultimate destination, this ultimate home, of eternal life when he teaches his disciples in verse chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 Jesus says in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so I would have told you I am going there to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am to our gracious God once all sinners. That's where our gracious God wants you and me to spend eternal life with him. And so aren't we eternally grateful for this road map of peace, this road map of peace that is laid out throughout all of scripture, laying out God's plan of salvation. Here's what I'm going to do to accomplish this grace and forgiveness so that you can be where I am, right? It gives us a spiritual sense of direction. How do I live my life now? How is it that I have this hope, this certain hope of reaching eternal life in heaven? It's God's roadmap for peace, the peace of grace, the peace of forgiveness. It kind of concerns me when I see people who don't know how to use a good old-fashioned paper map. It kind of concerns me because it kind of tells me that person doesn't really have a sense of direction. Where am I? Where do I find myself on this, this old-fashioned paper map? I don't know where I'm going. What do these words mean? What does that mean? What does all this stuff mean? All this information kind of reminds me of the information found in the Bible, right? You think about that? If you don't understand what the Bible is, you don't understand the purpose of the Bible, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines, it's just a bunch of maybe interesting information. But when we understand the significance, the significance of God's roadmap for peace that we have in that Holy Scripture, here's this plan of salvation, here's this roadmap, here's this good old fashioned Old, old good old fashioned map. I don't rely on that piece of electronic in my pocket and just say, oh, turn right here, oh, turn left there, and I'll get there. No. God very clearly, God very specifically tells us here's where you started, damned sinner. Here's where you are. You have my grace. You have that grace through that gift of faith. And here's where you're going, your final destination. Thankfully, that eternal home in heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you kindly stand? Now may the grace of God which surpasses all our human understanding guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach that eternal home in heaven. Amen.
I'm on the middle of page 8. Let's join together and confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Again, right, we go through the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. We're doing that. We're confessing. Here's the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, accomplishing everything for our salvation. Let's join in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And as part of our worship, we bring our thank offerings to the Lord's altar, part of our daily living. One of the ways we say thank you to God for the gift of that daily bread and so much more that he gives us. So let's join together in our offering prayer, and then we'll sing our offering hymn. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you were rich as the almighty Son of God. Yet for our sakes you became poor, so that through your humble incarnation and sacrifice we might become rich through the forgiveness of our sins. Accept this offering as one of the ways we say thank you for all you have done for us. Amen. keeping a couple of Christian families in our prayers. Um, thinking back a week ago this, this morning, uh, at, right at this time, we had a prayer for Iona Karstens uh, for God's blessing her with health. And it was interesting, humanly speaking, that God at that very moment was taking her home to heaven. Um, so long story to say, Iona Karstens went, went home to heaven, thankfully. And uh, her Christian funeral was uh, this week, Thursday, keeping Iona's family in our prayers. But then also, uh, Margie Rosh, uh, she turns 100 tomorrow. Happy birthday, Margie. And uh, keeping uh, Margie and her family in our prayers, thankful for this time of grace that God has given to her as, as well. Let's pray. Lord of the living and master of life, the lives we live are in your hands. You have created life, and you alone sustain and provide all that we need to live. Through the miraculous gift of faith, through the Holy Spirit, you have ignited and stoked the fires of our faith. 
We ask this morning that you give us the strength and courage to live our lives so that we give clear testimony to the importance you have in our lives. Use us to share your words of salvation so that as many as possible may hear the word and trust in Jesus as their Savior from sin. Constantly remind us of the love you showed all of mankind by sending your Son to be our substitute from sin. Give us the motivation to forgive those who sin against us exactly the same way you forgive us through your Son, Jesus. Help us to see that your commandments are not bothersome and a terrible inconvenience in our lives, but we thank you for them since your law is a guide for this complicated life. Do not let our love for one another go only as far as our words, but encourage us to show others this love by the way we talk to and treat those people around us. You, Lord, are the only lasting comfort and peace for us sinners as we deal with the consequences of sin in our lives, with death being the most extreme consequence. But for the Christian, you have promised that death is not to be feared, since through Jesus' death our sins have been forgiven, and through physical death you bring us to be with you eternally in heaven. In your perfect, loving wisdom, you have brought your servant Iona Karstens to be with you, Thank you for blessing Iona with the most precious gift of faith. And now be with and strengthen Iona's family in the days ahead through that same power of Christian faith which turns to and trusts in your gospel promises. Use all of us as Christian brothers and sisters to encourage and help in the days ahead until we all join with Iona and all those saints already home. God of all creation, we offer you grateful praise for the gift of life. Each and every birthday we have reminds us of the gift of life and the time of grace you have given to each of us. Hear the prayers for your servant, Margie Rosh, with whom we join in thanking you for your gifts of salvation, earthly blessings, and family and friends. Bless Margie with your presence and surround her with your love, that she may enjoy even more of your blessings now, but one day for eternity with you in heaven. Almighty God, we at St. Paul's give thanks to you for opportunities past and present to worship, study, and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. As we come together to commit ourselves to your direction for our future, we lift our hearts in gratitude, O Lord, for all those who helped prepare the way for us, for their worship, devotion, service, and care of this beloved church, school, and property. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us in faith for the future. Trusting in your love, help us to move forward with open and willing hearts so that we continue to grow and serve you to the glory of your name. We ask these things, dear Father, as we also give you our thanks and praise because your Son, Jesus, has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. You know, prepare our hearts for receiving the sacrament, uh, examining ourselves. We do that with our liturgy continuing there on page 9. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And after he gave thanks, he broke that bread, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus also took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. and encourage all those confirmed members of our congregation here at St. Paul's or of our sister congregations of the Wells of Wisconsin Synod to come forward and receive God's grace through Jesus' body and blood. Uh, all of us thanking God for being with us through his gospel, uh, word, and sacrament, let's join together. Thank the Lord. together our closing prayer. We pray. Lord God, through your mercy, I have another day of grace, and I'm also blessed to be with my Christian brothers and sisters here in your house, to be strengthened in my faith, and to give you my thanks and praise. Use the gospel which I have heard in your word and received in your holy supper to grow in me and to produce selfless service for you and the people around me. Strengthen me so that I serve you with all I say and do this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. That's hymn number 182.
Good morning again. Thank you. Welcome for our visitors. Good to have you with us with us this morning. Um, I don't have too much extra to share with you. Just to, to stay up to snuff with what's going on with the campaign. That's why those inserts are being in there. And if you if you missed a, a newsletter thing, there's there's previous uh, editions, copies of that in the back. And, and I say that because there's some a uh, couple of pretty important weekends coming up. Uh, two and three weekends from now. Uh, two weekends from now is what, what's being called uh, Witness Weekend. Um, and some of the leaders, again, will be getting up and sharing information, uh, what's going on and progress being made, but then also uh, three weekends from now uh, will be what, what's called Commitment Weekend, that um, broadening the opportunities for, for people to hear about uh, information and, and make commitments, pledges towards this building project that, that we have in mind. Uh, so things are, things are happening, uh, even in the middle of summer here, and continue, continue to ask God's blessings on, on our future plans, to see where we go with how we do ministry here at St. Paul's. Um, Jerry. Yeah, I'd like to uh, make a plea out there for anybody that has time this afternoon at about 2 o'clock. We're going to be over to school at the South Wing, the South End uh, Kindergarten, first and second grade rooms, to empty them out. Uh, Charlie Schlomer is going to be coming in and uh, taking up the asbestos tile for us. And he's going to be in the middle of the month. And so we need to get those empty. We've got dollies in place already. And everything ready to go. The teachers have their things packed up. So we need to have some volunteers come over and help them empty them out. If I can get some help with that this afternoon, we can push it at about 2 o'clock. So part of this whole whole big big picture of uh, updating facilities is to refresh that, that south wing. And uh, part of that will be starting shortly and, and just moving, moving stuff from what? Kindergarten, first and second grade rooms, uh, move, just moving it from there into the gym. Yes. So it's not too complicated, what have you, if you can be there. What'd you say, Gary, two? Two o'clock. Two p.m. Uh, everything is, I think, right, Shannon? Everything's packed up, putting you on the spot, ready to go. <laughs> Shannon and then Sarah, Sarah's here too, right? You're ready to go, so should, shouldn't be that big of a deal. But it, your help would be greatly appreciated. How's that? Okay. All right, thank you, Gary. Anything else? Happy birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to Margie. Shall we do that? Scott Brown is not here to start us off, but uh, all, all, uh, hopefully I don't start us off too low. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. on. Blessings, <laughs> blessings on your weeks ahead, and God willing, we'll see you back here in God's house next weekend. Good morning. Mm -hmm.